So ladies and gentlemen, can we uh, please welcome Simon Schamelkamp. Now, in the uh, retail industry, there was a big survey done, a global survey done in 1996, trying to discover where people made their decisions. Did people tend to make their decisions before they got to the store, or did they come to the store and then make their decisions? And in the results of that survey, um, which have now been widely discredited, suggested that about 75% of decisions are made in store. That has been enormously influential on the industry. So brands from um, manufacturers like Procter & Gamble and Unilever and so forth, who'd spent an enormous amount of time and investment on understanding consumers, i.e. the people that, bought their, uh, that, that ate their products, put their products on their faces and so on and so forth, they spent the vast majority of their research spend on understanding the process of consumption. They spent very little time in understanding how people shopped for those products. This piece of data basically influenced the whole industry to change the way that it thought about understanding not only consumers but also shoppers as well. So little consultancies like mine that started in the back end of the 80s and the early 90s, uh, there was us in the UK, uh, Sorensen and Varacel in the US and Georges Chatechine in France who were the pioneers really of shopper research. And we started the process of shopper research by adapting traditional market research techniques, whether quantitative or qualitative, basically by um, interviewing uh, people. One of the things we learnt through that was perhaps surprisingly that it seemed that people were unaware of a lot of the things that they did when they were shopping. So we then went on to try and find different techniques and the first of those was to use video. So we installed cameras into stores and watched what people did, tried to analyse how long they spent, the directions that they went around the store, where they stopped, how they interacted and so on. On from there, in the early 90s, we then started to use a piece of equipment called um, eye tracking. This is the, one of the very early prototypes that we used in store. And this allows us to see exactly what the shopper looks at. So we have the scene camera, which is the overall view, and those crosshairs are specifically what the shopper is looking at as they're walking around the store. So it gives us the ability to perhaps understand whether people are reading information, where they're reading that information um, as they go through the process of shopping. Later on in the 90s, um, we started using virtual reality, so um, perhaps surprisingly, the first retailer in the world to build a virtual store was the co-op uh, in, in the, the UK, working with Salford University. And this was the first time that we were able to do research in virtual reality to discover how people would interact with products that perhaps didn't uh, yet exist. Um, and on from there to um, then exploring um, using RFID tags, um, where we had very frequency tags attached to trolleys that would track the movement of the trolleys as they walked around the store. Um, and there are now permanent installations, both in the UK, US and China, in the big retailers that are basically monitoring where people are going around the store and taking the transaction log to find out what they're buying uh, on that shopping journey. So there's been a huge amount of investment in developing new techniques to understand what is happening um, in the store. What we're perhaps missing, however, is the reasons why. And that's what I want to talk to you um, about today. Because what we've discovered in that journey as we've gone through the process of filming and eye tracking and using VR um, and then on into brain scanning, which is the, the results of which I'm going to share with you today, is that about only about 5% of the things that we do, we do consciously. The vast majority of the things that we do are unconscious, emotionally um, formed, and non-verbal. So if I go to a store and ask you, what have you done, where have you gone, and so on, most of those things you've not done consciously. We don't walk into a store, for example, and think, right, I'm now going to walk for five metres, I'm now going to turn left, I'm going to stop at this particular fixture, and I'm going to start scanning from left to right, from the top shelf to the bottom, and so on which as brands and retailers is exactly the kind of information that we need to try and improve and make the shopping process um, easier. Here's a great example. We've got a guy here in a drugstore 
shopping for uh, deodorants. Now we interview him when he leaves the yard. And what he tells us that he's done is that he's bought the same brand that he always did, that he hadn't considered anything else, and that in fact testing wasn't important to help him make a decision. So the complete opposite of what he'd actually done. Now, when we go into stores, do we suddenly become liars? Of course not. What it is, is that because most of the things we do, we do unconsciously, we have a perception about how we shop. I'm very reluctant when I go to a dinner party to say to people what I do, because the immediate response is, well, when I go shopping, I'm completely different to everybody else, and I do da 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 I'm like, yeah, okay, fine, fair enough, thanks. <laughs> Can we talk about something else? The key learning that we've had from cognitive neuroscience is that we're moving away from the thinking that consumers make rational choices and can explain those choices towards an understanding that actually the majority of the things that we do are emotionally formed decisions that pretty much we're unable to explain or even to understand what it is that we've done. If I asked you for a show of hands and said, who in here in this room makes rational decisions, my guess would be the majority of people would say, yes, I'm a rational decision maker. This goes back to Descartes in the 16th century when he wrote these discourses and he was trying to talk about why man is different to the animals. And what he suggested was that the, one of the fundamental differences between men, mankind and the animals was that our ability to make rational decisions. In fact, he argued that men were better than women because women tend to make emotional decisions. What's 1996, a guy called Damasio wrote a book called Descartes' Error. And in that book, he basically describes, via the scientific work that he'd done in the field of neuro uh, neuroscience, the proof that actually when we make decisions, we are using our emotions to give both value to those decisions. So it may feel like they were making rational decisions, but we're using an emotional context in which to make those choices. So the, the information I'm going to share with you today um, is as a result of combining the eye tracking that we were looking at a second ago with both deep brain scanning, seen in fMRI, where we basically somebody lies inside a massive magnet, and using eye tracking combined with um, EEG, which is where we're monitoring the electrical activity just on the cortex uh, of the brain. Here you can see somebody in a store wearing both the eye tracking and um, the EEG. What that work has basically given us is a new paradigm in terms of how we think about what happens in the way that we make decisions. We're moving away from a model that is expecting people to think, then do, then feel, to the reality that in fact we feel, then we do, then we think. So let's look at the process of, of, of going shopping. Any shopping trip, whether it's to go and buy a dress or to buy some food or whatever it is, basically goes through this process. There is some kind of trigger that establishes the task. You choose a context in which to do that task. And then there's some kind of journey program that comes as a result of that. So the trigger, as far as going into supermarkets is concerned, might be something that's very planned. You know, I go and do my big weekly shop on a Wednesday evening, whatever it might be. Or it might be an impulse visit. I'm thirsty, I want to buy a, a, a drink uh, to, to, to uh, assuage that thirst. So that trigger then creates a task, a mission, which might be, again, the big weekly shop. It might be topping up to buy a few bits of food for a meal tonight, and so on. Now, because we do this on a very regular basis, 80% of us actually shop in the same store every week, we have subconsciously learnt how long that process takes. So if I interviewed you as you came out of the store and said, how long did you spend in the store today? You would be able to report, probably within a few minutes, accurately how long you actually spent on that process. Because as I say, we've subconsciously allocate time to this, this process of going shopping. So having decided on a mission, we then choose an environment to do that. That might be a hypermarket, it might be a mom and pop store, um, it might be a, a, a convenience store, whatever. Now the interesting thing is because we shop in these stores on a regular basis, we've learned what's called a cognitive map. What do I mean by that? Most of you go shopping, I'm sure. Picture the store that you go to most frequently. Stand yourself in the doorway. 
Now, can you picture where the bread is in the store? Can you picture where milk is in the store? Soft drinks, Christmas snacks, maybe wine. Most of you will be able to um, picture where those locations are in the store because you've done what's called a cognitive map of that space. You've used that space on a regular basis and you've learnt it. Another example, if you think about your journey home, say from the office, you turn left and you turn right, you stop and you go straight over and so on and so forth. You're not consciously thinking about this process because you've learnt a cognitive map of the journey home. That is why the majority of uh, traffic accidents, the vast majority of traffic accidents, are within three kilometres of the home. It's because the majority of people are driving two tonnes of steel unconsciously. How frightening is that? And another example of this cognitive mapping is that when you interview people and you ask them how did you shop the store, about a quarter of people, no matter where you are in the world, whether I do this work in Abu Dhabi, um, in Sydney or in the, in the UK, about 25% of people will say, I went up and down every single aisle. I browsed the whole store. The reason why they say that is because they follow their cognitive map for when they do a main shop. But if I haven't got a dog or a cat, I'm not going to go down the pet food aisle. If I haven't got a baby, I'm not going to go down through the baby aisle. And every time you go shopping, you don't buy household cleaning products, perhaps, or whatever. There are a large number of categories that we buy on an infrequent basis. My perception is that I've shopped the whole store. This chart here is as a result of filming those people that said I went up and down every single aisle. In fact, fewer than 2% covered more than half of the store. A massive disconnect, again, between perception and reality. It's because you've shopped using that cognitive map. And as we walk around the store, we don't use signs. We don't walk around the stores that we're familiar with, looking up at the signs that says soft drinks and bread and all those kind of things. What we use is what we call signpost brands. So Nescafe, I may not go on to buy it, but it tells me that's where hot beverage is. Coke tells me where soft drinks is. Walker's Crisps tells me where the Christmas snacks are is. So I'm actually walking around the store Following this cognitive map, over two-thirds of us won't have a shopping list. And those that do have a shopping list will, on average, only have nine items on it. So we're actually using the store as our shopping list. We're using these signpost brands to remind us of the categories that we may want to go shopping in. And what's interesting is, when we look at that process using eye tracking, very, very quickly, I glance down an aisle. Signpost brand, I don't need to go down there. Glance down an aisle. Signpost brand, I don't need to go down there. Glance down and ask, signpost brand, ah yes, that's the category I want, and off I go, and I'm onto the, the, uh, into the shopping process. And what's fascinating is that when we look at what happens in, in our brains when we use fMRI, when we see a signpost brand, not only is there a, 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 a salience, which is why I understand what I'm looking at, but the ways that our eyes actually move from reflexive so if you walk down the street, your eyes are just gathering information to intentional, which means that I'm now searching. So those signpost brands trigger what's called a learnt script of behaviour. We learn how to shop for milk. Every time you go shopping for milk, you don't shop in a different way. You shop the category in the same way. This is why when we interview people about what really pisses you off about supermarket shopping is when they move the store around, so you're disrupting the cognitive map, and when they move the things around in the fixture. Because actually, most of the categories that we shop on a regular basis, we have learnt where the brands that we normally buy are actually located on the shelf. All of this starts to feed towards what a huge amount of processing in our brains is going on that we are not aware of, that we are un doing unconsciously. Most of the time, because we've learnt how to do it. So I thought it would be worth Having talked about the role of vision, vision basically drives about 75% of our, our behaviours. I thought we were going to spend a little time just talking about how we actually see, because our perception of how we see things and how we actually, the, the mechanical process, the, the biophysiological process of how we actually do see, are quite different. And if we're moving towards trying to change the way that people do things by perhaps putting signs in stores, putting information on wrapping and labelling and all that kind of stuff, it's fundamentally important to have an understanding about how we actually go through the process of seeing. Just going to do this. This is an awareness test. How many?
many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Show of hands, who saw the bear the first time? A few of you, a few of you. That um, is based on um, some work that was done by um, two guys, Simon and uh, Shadris at uh, Harvard University. And it's something that's called inattentional blindness. And it starts to point towards how our vision processing actually works. The reason why that piece of um, TV works is because actually most of the things that are in front of us we don't actually see. Our brains can only cope with about seven bits of visual information at any one time. So in fact, of all the visual stimulus in front of us, we'll take in about 1% and we'll actually process only 5% of the 1%. So our vision processing system is not designed to gather information. In fact, it's designed to discard information. So by setting you the task of looking for things that are white in that film, you may well have looked at the black bear, but because you, were, you had tasked your brain to look for white things, you would have discarded that uh, information as irrelevant to your task. So if we look at the way that the eyes work, basically there's a cross-section through the eye. We'll probably remember our biology lessons from school. The back of the eye is the retina. So as the, as the visual information comes through the lens, it's projected onto the retina at the back, back of our eyes, which gives me basically the ability to, roughly speaking, cover about 200 degrees. But do we see that 200 degrees? No, we don't. In the centre, just above the centre of the retina, is a tiny area called the fovea. And basically, the, uh, um, half of the optic nerves that go, that, uh, that, uh, go back into the, into the brain all come out of the fovea. The vast majority, over 95% of our vision processing, happens through that tiny little area. And to give you an idea, instead of it being 200 degrees, if you hold your hand out in front of you with your thumb up and look at your thumbnail, that's the size of the scene that you're processing at any one time. That's called foveal attention. And when I show you the films of the eye tracking with the crosshairs, it's the crosshairs that is basically the fovea. Now, the fovea just doesn't stay there. It's click moving around all the time. You've seen that already from the, the eye tracking films. Basically, that area is made up predominantly of the photoreceptors called cones. That do our colour, density, depth perception and so forth. Our rods, which, call, which cover the, the vast majority of the rest of the retina, are adapted for low light. So you know, in the winter, you've been in a bright room, you go outside, it slowly your eyes adjust to give you night vision. What your brain is doing is dialing down the information from the sight coming from the cones and dialing up the information from the rods so that you can adapt to see better at, at night. And the vast majority of cones are in that area of the fovea. So what's basically happening is that our eyes are jumping around and sampling bits of information from the scene that's in front of us. And this whole process happens subconsciously. One of the questions I'm often asked about eye tracking was, well, surely you put these strange glasses on, people are going to behave differently. This is a guy in a McDonald's store ostensibly deciding which burger he's going to buy. <laughs> Let's hope it's not his sister. Okay, um, eye tracking. So basically reveals the thought. Now we're subconsciously just on, on that note. Actually, we are sub unconsciously, subconsciously programmed to gather information about the opposite sex in a particular way. So I can guarantee what men will look at when they, they approach a woman. I can also guarantee what a woman will look at when they approach a man. We are pre-programmed to look at specific areas of the body when we're making judgments about other people. 
The answers are obvious, by the way. <laughs> um, so this is some work that was done in 1967 by a guy called Yarbus in the US. One of the very early parts of eye tracking research. The picture that you can see in the top left of the slide there is called The Homecoming. It's a very famous Russian painting. And you have a man walking through the door, a servant standing holding the door open, a woman standing up, and two children sat at, at the table. When he gave his respondents, first of all, the picture, this is what the results of the eye tracking in free examination. As soon as he gave them a task, however, the way that people's eyes moved to answer, to complete that task, changed. So this one, estimate the material circumstances of the family. Give the ages of the people. Remember the clothes that are worn. Remember positions of people and objects in the room. With each task, the way that people gathered information from the scene changed unconsciously. We've got two different major, two, two, two different types of eye movement that we're interested in. Saccades and fixations. Again, you'll have seen the eye jumping around. It's momentarily stopping. It stops for about 350 milliseconds and at that point information goes back into the brain. It then jumps, or saccades, to somewhere else. And the reason what, ha what, what happens is that at the, on the edge of our fovea, we're giving what's called covert attention to the rest of the scene to basically say, where do I go next to gather information? <coughs> and that movement is generally driven by task and training. So the reason why, in this instance, the gorilla, which was the original experiment, or the moonwalking bear, is that your task was to look for white things. Your brain was unconsciously instructing you to fixate to jump to somewhere else where there was information relating to either balls or white things. That jump takes about 20 milliseconds. It's the fastest movement of the human body. And at that point, there's no information being sent back to your brain. So essentially, if I slow it right down, what's essentially happening is that your sample, jump, nothing, in, sample, switch off, sample, switch off. So you're basically scanning and sampling little bits of data from the scene that's in front of you and you're using your peripheral vision to basically estimate what else is there in front of you. So basically you're not seeing the whole scene all the time. What you're seeing is tiny little pieces of information from the scene and your brain is filling in what's likely to still be there as a result of that. Our peripheral vision is basically designed to establish movement and contrast. Why? Well, because our eyes basically are designed, as we are, to live in the savanna. Movement basically potentially means a saber-toothed tiger. So it's fairly important you're going to fixate there next, when you may be looking over there. So something happening over here will switch your attention. Okay. So that's how we see. We're sampling little bits of information dependent on the tasks that we have. So if I'm shopping in a supermarket, and I walk into a typical aisle, where, by the way, in a typical aisle there will be 20,000 products, 20,000, each of them with four or five different visual elements, a logo, a brand name, pack size, a picture, whatever, whatever. And our brains can only cope with seven bits of information at any one time. Going supermarket shopping is probably the, only, the worst experience in terms of visual overload. And we expect people to see things in that context. Question, who's been to Boots got to the checkout, and the person working at the checkout says, you do realise that's on three for two? And you go back to the shelf, and there's a bloody great sign that says three for two. How did you miss that? How many times have you been in a store and said, excuse me, can you tell me where so-and-so is? And they go, it's there. Can't see for looking. Visual overload. And again, we're hoping to influence what people do. If we're trying to change the behaviours of shoppers towards things like local food, We've got an enormous barrier, first of all, because of that issue of visual overload. So, for most people, going shopping is a chore. I don't want to be there. It's a pain that I have to spend three quarters of an hour going around the store and buying 60 items on a weekly basis, and I'll probably go back to the store or another store two or three times to replenish the stuff that I've run out of. So, how do, what impact does that have on the kind of decisions that we're making in store? Okay, so if we look at what you might call a proper decision, let's say you're in the market to buy a new mobile phone. You'll perhaps go online and do some research. You'll perhaps go to a store and talk to a member of staff. 
and you'll talk to friends and family, get some advice. You'll go through five or six researching phases, most people will, before they get to the final point of making a decision. That is classic conditioned decision making. Basically, you, what you're doing is you're learning to give you the rational criteria to allow you to make the right decision between an iPhone or a Blackberry or whatever it might be. Does that happen in store? Does 75% of the products that we buy involve this kind of decision-making process when we go to the store? No, it doesn't. What happens when we come to a category like, let's say, recipe sources? How many people get to recipe sources and pull out the iPhone and, and search on the online whether they should buy dolmi or ragu? How many people will pick up the phone and phone a friend? I'm in front of recipe sources, I don't know whether to buy bolognese or carbonara, what should I do? And of course we don't. We don't go through that um, process, even when we're faced with such a confusing array as a category like recipe sources. What do we do? We rely on learnt cues to make erratic assumptions. We use things like where it is on the shelf, the cues that we're given from the packaging, the size of the brand block and so forth, to make assumptions about what that particular product is or does, about the role that that brand particularly plays. In this category, for example, we've got Lloyd Grossman, who's sort of, sort of some kind of chefy fellow, isn't he? And his packaging is upmarket. Do we go through the process of looking at the information that's on the pack? No, we just look at the style of the packaging and say, well, broadly speaking, I think that's upmarket, that's a better product than the Dolmia or the Rago, perhaps. Ragu, perhaps. So, in fact, we're not actually talking about decision making in store. What we're talking about is marginal choice making. We don't go through some linear formal process of learning and researching before making our final choice in the vast majority of categories that we buy in the supermarket. Now, this thinking has fundamentally challenged the way that the whole marketing industry thinks because models like IDA the hierarchy of what's called a hierarchy of effects model is the basis for the vast majority of advertising activity. That there will be some kind of linear process that by seeing advertising we will gather your attention, we will create interest as a result of that desire and, uh, and then eventually resulting in action. And all advertising is based on these sorts of models and they just don't work. We do not go through some kind of linear process. And, in store, we rely on something that we call decision trees. So pretty much every manufacturer will have done some research with some research agency that will have this process of, um, somebody gets to soft drinks, for example, and then says, do I want to buy colas, carbonates, or flavoured carbonates? Well, I want to buy colas. Um, do I want to buy a brand or private label? I want to buy a brand, uh, pack size, and so on. This idea that we're going through a series of rational choices, probably trading off against price, to come to a final choice. If we really shopped like that, it would take about 14 hours to get around the store. What happens is that we would make marginal choices, and as a result of those marginal choices, most of the time, we actually end up buying the same brand every week. Picture your kitchen, your bathroom, open the cupboards in your head. The brands that are in there, most likely, are the brands that you buy last week, and the week before, and the week before. We don't want to go through the whole process every time I get to soft drinks. <gasps> oh, what do I do here? How do I shop this? Which, what, what should I want to put? We know already before we get to the fixture in the vast majority of time, the most, my most often preferred brand. And most often, I'll repeat purchase it. I'll probably have two or three other brands that are probably substitutable. So actually what happens is that when you introduce another factor, for example, time pressure. So if I'm in a small basket shop, I'm in the store, I want to get in and out as quickly as possible, I'm actually less likely to repeat purchase because as soon as I can't see the brand I'm looking for, oh, this one will do, and then it goes into the trolley. When I'm doing a big shop, I'm much more likely to repeat purchase because I've got time available to find the brands that I normally buy. So marginal choice making basically means is that we're making assumptions. And I'll give you an example. Think about the washing powder you use, whether it's aerial or personal or tide or whatever it is. Would you call yourself an experienced enough chemist to be able to make a judgment about how eff efficiently your washing powder cleans fabrics both visibly and invisibly? I would suggest probably not. Yeah, I would also suggest you're pretty likely to be loyal to that particular brand. You think that it washes better perhaps than the others. Have you done an experiment? Have you bought every single washing powder that's available in the market and tried each one? Again, I suggest probably not. 
And if you think about the majority of categories that you buy, I would suggest that you have come to it, this one will broadly do for my needs. Because in fact, if I buy the wrong brand of washing up liquid, hold on, my husband's not going to leave me, uh, my children aren't going to run away from the home, it's not that important. Most of the categories, for most people, most of the categories that they buy in supermarkets are just simply not that important to go through the mobile phone process of learning and research, learning and research, and then finally <coughs> making a choice. Most of the products that we buy are broadly acceptable, and that will do. So what that means is that, in fact, for most of the brands that we buy, we have what's called an emotional packet. I use very simple visual cues to recognise the brand that I normally buy, and I, as a result of that, that triggers an emotional packet, a collection of memories that are associated with that particular brand. The stronger that emotional packet is to me, the stronger the relationship that I have with that emotional packet, the less likely I am to use rational filters like price to make a final choice. If I asked most of you how important price was, most of you would tell me price is very important. From 2008, as we went into recession, the importance of price as a factor of making choices was claimed by shoppers to be more and more important. For most of you, if I said, how much do you spend when you go to Sainsbury's, you would be able to roughly give me a pretty good idea of how much it would be. And if I said, if you went to Waitrose, you would be able to give me a rough idea of what a typical weekly shop would cost. The average shopper looks at price labels twice in 60 minutes of shopping. Partly because we're not remaking the decisions every time we go to the fixture. Because we know that we buy Coke 2 litre and we've looked ages ago at the price and it's kind of okay, so it goes in the trolley. So in fact, price, which is the most common conversation that brands and, brands and uh, retailers have, is actually very rarely the most influential factor in, in your final choice. So when we look with eye tracking at the brand that we most often buy, what we see is that the insula, which is where the, 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 uh, those emotional packets, if you like, are stored, is highlighted. So when you see a brand that you like, the emotional packet in the, in the brain highlights. As I said earlier on, memory and emotion give values to the different options that are in front of us. Our memory basically works. There's not one place in our brains where there's a sort of a memory lump. Our memories are dispersed right around the brain. Now, as we all know, again from our school biology, our brains are made up of billions of neurons. And each neuron is connected via a gap, synaptic gap, to the next neuron. And when we respond to something, basically what happens is a sequence of neurons fire. And if they do that again, Every time that, that same sequence fires, we become more and more sensitised. And that's basically how memory works. As I reuse and reuse and reuse that same sequence of firings of neurons, that basically creates a memory. So, let's use the example of a door. Most of us are familiar with a door. Anybody don't know what a door is? Good, excellent. OK, so we've all got memories of doors. What's interesting about memory is that not only do we have memories of doors, but we have a memory of uh, doors in a network of hundreds and hundreds of others' associations. So I might have memories of doors in kitchens and sitting rooms, I might have memories of doors outside, I might have memories of doors from some kind of childhood experience. I've got memory that the fact that doors open and close, that I can walk through them. I've also got a motor memory. I don't, whenever I come up to this door with a, that's got a handle thing, I don't have to think, I wonder how that works. We've got a motor memory that allows us to go through the motor process of opening and closing. In fact, amazingly, we'll also be able to know which way the thing is going to go most of the time. I've got a, a memory of the door as a conceptual idea. The doors of the mind and all those kind of things. And I've got a memory of the written word itself. So that collection of circles and uprights and so forth, I've learned to have a memory of the word door. And I also have an oral memory as well, because I know what the word door sounds like, a phonetic memory uh, as well. Now, those memories of doors are not, as I say, in one little lump in the middle of our brain. They're dispersed around the brain. So the motor memory, for example, is likely to be in the top part of your brain where, where the um, cortex organises our, our motor activity. And the front part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, in response to seeing a door, will call up from different areas of the brain the relevant memories to allow you to do the task of walking uh, through the door. 
I'll jump over this. And the more that we use that memory, the stronger it becomes. Picture, if you will, your childhood bedroom. Most of you would have had a chest of drawers in that bedroom. Can you see it? Can you remember it? If you open the top drawer, can you remember what you used to keep in the top drawer? Now, I guess for most of you, that chest of drawers in your life was not that important. But amazingly, because you used that memory so many times, you've still got that stored in your brain. The other way to encode memory is that the stronger the emotional context of that encoding, the more likely we are to be remembered. I'm bitten as a child by a dog. I hate dogs for the rest of my life. Yeah? The emotional context of that encoding of that memory about dogs was such an intense emotional experience that it's deeply ingrained in how I then go on and behave for the rest of my life. And it's the emotional context that now, in terms of thinking about advertising, is where we are going in terms of how we strengthen our memories of brands. Because, of course, we have formal ways of getting memories across, advertising, in-store display, product experience and so forth. But there are many informal ways that people interact with brands and, and messaging and so on and so forth that we have, as a marketing industry, have no control of. All of those things build together to create the emotional packets that we have in our brains. So in summary, if we're trying to communicate about new ideas, if we're trying to talk to people about how we should change, and we're hoping to use the store to do that, we have to be both combine very simple messaging and very consistent messaging if we have any kind of hope of cutting through the enormous amount of noise that is happening when we walk around in the store and combined with, for the vast majority of people, a very low level of interest in the process that they're actually going through, which is going shopping in a store. Thank you very much.